Hi, my name is Wesley, otherwise known as HeyW, and I'm a freelance 3D artist and animator. This is part 4 of my series on making an animated short from scratch, and this video will be all about the animation. Now, it took around 10 hours to animate this sequence, so I won't be able to go over every detail, although I will be able to cover a good amount, and I'll be more focused on the techniques and the tools, how to use them, and things you can do to enable you to work faster. For starters, I opened this template scene I've made. This is mostly just an empty scene, but with some things pre-configured. For starters, the render settings are set up to render animation at 1080p. Global illumination is enabled with the settings tweaked some. Also, the unified samples is bumped up a little. Other than that, I have this simple camera rig. It's film gate set to black, a few display settings turned on. Also, these custom attributes for adding camera shake. This object called lens, which is just a locator, but the position of this controls the focus distance. This also has a switch for motion blur. I'll talk a little bit more about setting this stuff up later, but I just want to mention this template scene as I make a copy of this and start every animation in it. For now though, all that's really needed is to create a new camera to be the shot cam. So in this scene, I'll reference in the set I made as well as the character. It's important to reference things rather than import them or, for example, animating in the set scene itself. This comes with a lot of benefits, the obvious being if you have to edit one of the reference scenes. Another big benefit is I have autosave set to every four minutes. If I had a big scene with a lot of terrain and a bunch of characters, saving that scene could take 10, 20 seconds, which would really get in the way happening every four minutes. But by referencing everything in, the scene file size stays very small and you won't even notice autosaves as so it'll pretty much save instantly. I'll ignore the camera to start and just focus on the first few seconds of animation, of course which starts with him in the house and then opening the door. And I don't try and animate the character in the door at the same time, since he's the one completely driving the door and the door doesn't really affect him too much, I instead focus on the character's motion and then afterwards I'll animate the door to follow that. And you'll see for this whole scene, I do the bulk of the animation in one pass and then make some tweaks here and there. This is what's usually referred to as straight ahead animation. I will sometimes uh, block out my shots or do what's called pose to pose, but I generally reserve this for when I'm trying to get the best possible quality or doing complicated actions. But generally I find straight ahead animation to be much faster. Now with the door opening motion and first step animated, I want to make a walk cycle I can blend into this and have him take a few more steps forward. So I'll open a new Maya window and animate this in an empty scene. One, so I can have it as a separate file that I can easily reuse. And two, it's just easier to animate walk cycles this way. So I'll start with posing the character some mid-step pose, usually when both feet are touching the ground. I'll then key all the controls at frame 0, and then copy and paste this keyframe to 12 and 24. Now I want to go to that in-between key at frame 12 and mirror the pose. There's a lot of scripts for this, I usually use Animbot's mirror pose function for this kind of thing. But to do it manually is just a matter of copying the pose on the left side, pasting it to the right, then vice versa, and then for the controls in the middle, selecting the translate X, the rotate Y and rotate Z, and typing in times equals negative one, and this should give you a perfectly mirrored pose. So now I have these two main walk poses, and if I play back, I have a very basic walk cycle. So now it's just a matter of adding keyframes in between these poses to make it more convincing. On the roots, translate Y keyframes, I edit the tangents to try and get some nice looking bobbing. And again, this is supposed to be looped, so I want to make sure I copy whatever I do to the last keyframe and paste it to the first keyframe, and vice versa. For the foot control, I need to focus on a few things. First, the foot roll needs to be only animated when the leg is near full extension. I also need to make sure to add a keyframe for the foot to actually lift up in the air as it moves to the front. And then probably most importantly, I need to make sure for the duration where the foot is contacting the floor that the translate Z is linear. As I'll be animating the whole character to move forward linearly, I need the feet to match that in order to minimize sliding. Although just setting the keyframes tangents to linear it looks a little too robotic, so I add a tiny bit of interpolation just to make it look a little more natural. And I'm only polishing the animation on one of the feet, as I'll just copy and paste it onto the other. But obviously I don't want both feet in perfect sync, so I need the other foot offset by 12 frames. So I'll copy and paste this animation so I have two cycles. I'll then copy and paste all of this onto the other foot and offset it back 12 frames. Then I'll just delete the excess for both so it's still 24 frames long. And now I should have a nice stepping cycle for both feet. Now I want to add some bobbing to the chest and head control to go with the up and down motion of the root controller. So the idea here is I want the chest controller to rotate forward around the X in response to the root controller dipping down, and then it's rotate back in response to the controller raising back up. And because I want the chest animation to look like it's a result of the root animation, I'll have this lag behind, usually two frames is a good amount. 
I'll take the exact same approach to the head animation, only it should lag even further behind since its motion should look like it's a result of the chest's motion. Lastly, I'll do the arm just like I did the legs, first polishing some nice swinging animation for one arm, then copy pasting that onto the other arm and offsetting it back 12 frames. From here, it's just a matter of tweaking the animation until it looks good enough to me. And you'll see I mostly work in the graph editor. If you're new to animation, I'd recommend getting familiar with this as quickly as possible. The last thing to do to this is make sure it's a perfect loop. The first thing I need to make sure is that the first pose and the last pose are exactly the same. So just by jumping from the first to last frame, I can see there's no change here, so I'm good there. But oftentimes you'll find playing this back, it doesn't look quite right. And if this is the case, it's probably because the tangents on the final frame don't go well with the tangents on the first frame. I'll purposely mess up the tangents on the last frame to make it really obvious what I'm talking about. So to fix this, I'll temporarily copy and paste the whole animation so it cycles twice, and on the 24th frame where the cycle resets, I'll zoom in, and now you can more clearly see the issue with the tangents. So the next step is to then edit these tangents until the cycle reset looks smooth. Usually I'll just grab everything and set the tangent type to automatic, and then I can manually tweak the ones that need it. Once done, I'll grab everything again and then grab all the tangents and just nudge them a tiny bit. You'll see that the icon at the tip of the handle will change. This indicates it's no longer in automatic mode. The reason for this is automatic tangents will move if you change what comes before or after them, so they'd actually get messed up in the next step. But by nudging them like this, it kind of locks them into place. Now I can delete everything after frame 24, then I'll copy the last frame and paste it onto frame 0. And now I should have a perfectly smooth and looping walk cycle. Now I want to get this animation into my main scene, and there's a lot of ways of transferring animation across scenes or across characters. The simplest just being copying the keyframes and pasting them, although this comes with one caveat, being the selection order must be exactly the same. Now you can manually select each controller and ensure that you select them in the same order every time, but an easier method is just to add a selection set to your character. So with the rig scene open, I've selected all the controls and now I'm creating this selection set. And this exact same setup could apply to any rig. And having this will make it really easy to copy and paste animation to and from it. Back in my main scene, I'll first reference in the walk cycle scene. And now you should see at the bottom of the outliner, there's two selection sets. One for the walk cycle character and the other for the character that was already in the scene. So grabbing all the controls on the main character, I'll create a new animation layer called walk. And then over on the walk cycle character, I'll select the top controller and then click and drag all the way down to select all of them in this specific order. Then I can copy the keyframes. Then I can go to the selection set on my target character and select the objects in exactly the same way. And this ensures the selection order is the same. So I can now paste and I have the walk cycle on my other character. Although it looks a bit wonky, this is because animation layers are set to add by default. I'll switch to override and I can see that it did paste correctly. Although I want this to cycle several times, I could keep pasting this over and over again, but a much cleaner way is to select all the keys, go to curves, and then under pre and post infinity, set those to cycle. So now I have this animation layer where the walk cycle loops forever, and I can easily just blend this in and out whenever I want the character to be walking. And I do want to keep this layer on add mode as I want to be able to animate on the base layer and add secondary animation when the character is walking. So the trick here is now to blend in the walk animation and have it look smooth. So the first thing is to blend in the weight from 0 to 1 over a couple of frames and then animate the master controller to move forward with it. And I'm using animation trails here to help me determine how much I should move the controller forward to avoid any foot sliding. And like I mentioned, the walk animation layer is set to add, so I need to keyframe on the base layer the character back to the resting pose for the walk to look normal. So I'll leave a few seconds of him walking forward. I also add some secondary motion of him looking around by animating the base layer. I then want him to come to a stop and look around some more. So I'll blend out the walk animation again, just like I did blending it in. And I'll animate on the base layer, him kind of recoiling as he comes to a stop. And so I've already framed up this shot, but for the rest of the animation, I want to frame the shot before I animate it. For one, so I know what to focus on. For example, there's no reason to animate the body if it's a close-up of the head. And then two, sometimes animation looks good from one angle, but not so great from another. And you can get kind of caught up trying to tweak it and make it look good from every angle. But with the shot already in place, you can see if it looks good from that view, then you can move on. Now as far as animation on the camera itself, I don't do anything crazy here. Mostly the camera is either just static or doing some slow trucking shot. One thing to make sure of though when animating the camera, panning or tracking around, is to make sure the keyframes are set to linear so you get nice consistent movement. 
I import this apple model I have and place it in the tree so I know where to point the camera for this shot. And I had this apple handy, but in situations where I need a prop, I wouldn't stop to go find it or make it. I'd rather just use a gray sphere or some kind of stand-in object so I can keep animating uninterrupted. Now I animate this reaction shot where he notices the apple and then rushes over to it. And like I mentioned before, because this is a close-up of the head, I just only need to focus on the head's animation. And as far as the rest of the body, I can just animate it sliding over as he runs off frame. In this next shot, I want him moving over towards the center of the frame to get a closer look at the apple. I can reuse the walk cycle for this, but I want him to look excited and almost be running over, so I'll need to make some adjustments to it. First, I'll select the walk animation layer and duplicate it, and then make all of my changes to this new layer. Obviously, I don't want to edit the existing one and mess up the walk animation on my previous shots. As far as the actual changes I'm going to make, I'm just going to speed it up a little and then grab the arms and raise them up, and this turns a normal walk into what looks like a little bit of a jog. I'll now blend this in and out using the same process as I did for the first walk. So now I animate him jumping up, reaching for the apple as if to grab it, even though it's obviously way too far. Then I kind of let him pause for a second, and in the next shot he looks over to the tree as if he has an idea, and then walks over towards it. And this walking over part is more of the same with blending in and out this walk cycle animation, with some animation on the base layer to make that transition look natural. I also want to take a second to mention I've changed the pose up some from the end of this shot to the start of the next. And I'll often do this, use a camera cut as an opportunity to repose a character or even move it slightly to better fit the framing of the new shot. And feel free to experiment with this as you can often push it pretty far and it still be unnoticeable, especially with uh, big camera angle changes like in this case. Here as the character comes to a stop, I animate his arms coming out and grabbing hold of the tree to then shake it. And I animate the tree shaking first and then the character to go along with that. Although I may have had an easier time if I took the same approach as I did to the door, where I first animate the character doing the motion and then animate the tree following whatever that motion dictates. In either case, the following setup will still work all the same. For the tree bending, I'll select the model and create a bend deformer. It's a pretty high poly tree, so animating this deformer does slow the scene down a little bit, although I could still animate in this perfectly fine. But let's say it was too slow, or I just want the scene running as smooth as possible. I'll create a cylinder and lay it over the trunk as kind of a low poly representation of the tree. Then I'll go to Window, Relationship Editors, and open up the Deformer Set Editor. I'll then locate the Bend Deformer Set and add the cylinder to this. Now the bend deformer will affect both objects. So I can just hide the tree, and now the scene plays back as fast as if the tree wasn't there at all. I still have the cylinder to kind of give me an idea of how much it's bending, and of course if I need to render or just need to see the tree for any reason, I can just unhide it. I also want the hands to stick to the trunk as it swings back and forth, and for this I'll create a locator and place it along the trunk roughly where I want the hands to be. Then with the locator and the trunk selected, I'll go to constraint and create a proximity pin. And now I've got this locator that's pinned to the trunk, which I can pair and constrain the arm controls to. Now I can just animate the curvature attribute on the bend handle to bend the tree back and forth, and then animate the character to go along with it. For this next shot, I also need the apple pinned to the tree, so I'll create a locator, roughly place it where the apple stem is, and then create a proximity pin just like before. But rather than parent constraining the entire apple, I'll only constrain the translations. That leaves the rotation free, as I want to animate this to kind of wiggle around as the tree is swinging. I won't animate this manually though, instead I'll use a few constraints to kind of do this for me. And I'll show the setup in an empty scene, just so it's a little easier to follow. So I've got this scene with just the apple, and then this object sliding back and forth to serve as the swinging tree. First I'll make sure the pivot is in the right position at the stem of the apple where I want it to swing from. Then as I mentioned I'll parent constraint, but only the translates, leaving the rotations free. Next I'll create a locator, and the position of this is what will determine how the apple swings, but I'll roughly place it under the apple for now and it can always be adjusted later. I'll then parent constraint this to the swinging object just like I did the apple. And by now I won't have anything too special, just all three objects moving together, but now I'll select the locator and bake out its translates. I'll then take the output keyframes and slide them back a few frames. And so now I have this locator that kind of drags behind the apple. Now I'll go back to the start frame, select the locator followed by the apple, and open up the aim constraint settings. I'll enable maintain offset, and then I want to set the aim vector to roughly align with the positions of the two objects. 
That is in this case, the apple being the starting point and the locator being the end point, which in this case, that direction will be along the negative Y. So in the aim vector, I'll set it to zero, negative one, zero. I'll click apply, play the animation, and now I have a swinging apple. And I can control this in two ways. One by offsetting the keyframes of the locator more or less to get more of a laggy swing. And also by moving the locator up or down or closer to the pivot, it'll make the swings more dramatic. And the final step would be to select the apple and then bake the constraints down to keyframes. So after some swinging back and forth, I continue the apple's motion by breaking off the branch from shaking too hard and then falling down and hitting him on the head, kind of knocking him out for a second. But then my idea was to end it on him getting back up, seeing the apple on the ground and then kind of having a happy expression now that the apple is in reach. And you may have noticed so far I have ignored the face. Usually I try and save it for last, especially if there's any kind of lip syncing. Although sometimes it is necessary to at least do some posing of the face. Uh, the eye direction or the facial expression can sometimes really influence how you animate. So the approach I usually take is if I feel like I can get away with it, I'll leave it to last. But if I need to, I'll animate the face as I animate the body. But as I mentioned, this is a situation where I saved the face for last. So as I'm wrapping up the body animation, I'll do one more pass through the whole thing, this time animating just the face. To make this a little more convenient, I'll go to the character rig and add a face cam. This is just an orthographic camera parented to the head controller. And the purpose of this is no matter where the head's facing, I can always look through this camera and get a clear view of the face controls. Now as planned, I'll run through the whole sequence doing the facial animation, and a simple face like this with no lip sync, it only takes a couple of minutes. So now the animation is done, what's left is just to add the effects, lighting, materials, and any extra details that seem worth the effort. And so that concludes part 4, I hope you found this useful, thank you for watching, and feel free to subscribe to the NVIDIA Studio YouTube channel for more videos like this.